President of Ukraine, President Kuchma, President Vishnevsky, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Coming to Yalta, one must remember immediately a great auto that has influenced our life when we are children and still is influencing the life of our children, Anton Chekhov. I thought that the real great dramaturgs of our time were Shakespeare and Chekhov. They didn't write musicals like in Hollywood. There wasn't a happy end to their stories. They had different approaches. Anton Chekhov was raising a voice against poverty, discrimination, poor people. Shakespeare was raising a voice for justice, for freedom. Their story were totally different. With Shakespeare, you have had heroes on the stage, fighting in a very dramatic way. And finally, by the end of the drama, all heroes were lying on the stage, totally dead, with the spirit of justice flying over them. <laughs> with Chekhov, no heroes, unhappy people, plain people, everybody is angry, frustrated, full of complaints, nothing is happening happily. But by the end of the drama, everybody is tired and disappointed, but alive. <laughs> so as a politician, I prefer the approach of Chekhov <laughs> than the approach of Shakespeare. With all due respect, we have to fight the daily demands, the poverty, the injustice, the discrimination. And if somebody thinks that life stands still, I think it's totally wrong. Recently, one of uh, an important journalist tried to explain what's happening in our time. And he says, until now, we have had uh, 192, today 193 states. Every state was like a ship with its own flag, its own captain, its own plan of traveling, of sailing. Today, there is no more, and the, the task of strategy and diplomacy was to prevent crashes among the ships. So we shall remain alive. Today, all of us are sailing just on one ship, one ship with 193 cabins. Instead of being a ship, a nation became a cabin. And what's happening to the ship affects every cabin, and what's happening in every cabin affects the ship. If somebody in the cabin, for example, will begin to play with nuclear bombs, the ship is in danger. If the ship will go to a strange destination, we don't know. Now the global ship, doesn't have a captain, doesn't have a flag. We don't know the voyage, where it goes. It affects each of us in the cabin, but none of us can affect the ship, including the major countries like the United States of America. So we feel like being in a ship with certain capriciousness, and uh, we don't know really how to navigate, how to behave, how to go out. Looking at the old economy is no solution. Because the old economy was based on accumulation, on I think the wealth that we accumulated. And the great economists tried to analyze what makes you rich, what makes you happy, but this was analyzing the past. There is no more any economist that can analyze a thing that doesn't happen, namely the future. 
Now, the economy does not hang upon what we have, but it depends upon what we are going to discover. And really, the major factor of our life is science rather than land or water or capital or people. And all the attempts to learn from the past is in vain. Neither Adam Smith nor Karl Marx can teach us very much. They are totally irrelevant to what's going to happen. And as a result of science becoming the major factor, the old borders disappeared. We live in a global society. There is no more really national, so national economies, only global economies. There is only national poverty. If you want to remain poor, you can do it as a nation. If you want to advance, you have to join in the global market. And the global market is a strange one. It's being affected by the people more than the people are being affected by them. For example, a good mood elevates economy. It has nothing to do with capital, nothing to do with work. You know, I saw when the Spanish football group won the match, immediately on the next day, all the Spaniards begin to buy. And the economy of Spain went up because of the victory of the football match. And who is the scientist who can tell us what will be the mood tomorrow morning? Unknown. And we don't, nobody can tell us what will a great scientist discover tomorrow. If you want to go to understand, try to understand the future of the economy, one shouldn't go to the banks or to the stock exchange. Go to the laboratories. See what is there. There is the economy of tomorrow. Nobody can control the scientist if economy is global. Science is individual. And when a scientist, scientist goes through the customs, who can check what he has in his head, what may be in his head? And uh, there is a competition. And when everybody is global, you know, it's hard to be a racist. It's hard to be national. You must have good public relations, good will. And today, the head, actually, the business are being run by the companies rather than by the governments. And the companies understand that they cannot sell just because they have a good product. They have to have also good relations. Because occasionally, decisions are being made upon your relations rather than upon your product. As a matter of fact, most of them are beginning to give back money to the communities. Rich people in America and in Europe too wouldn't like to appear, they're educated persons, they wouldn't like to appear as profiteering from the poverty, from the poor people. They know if they'll do it, they'll face a revolt. And they're trying very hard to pacify then the governments are also standing, in many ways, helpless, hopeless. The governments today, permit me to say, are afraid to govern. They want to be all the time popular. You cannot govern with popularity. You have to change. And the people say that the government is so anxious to be popular, they stop to trust them. Say, look, gentlemen, you're thinking about yourself, not about us. And the concept, uh, Alexander, about leadership has changed. A leader today is not a man that stands on the top, but a man that goes ahead. If you, mean to, you want to be on the top, the bottom will not support you. On top of all those problems, we have another one. A young generation. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody's asking about the revolt in Egypt, in Tunisia, in other places. But look at your own homes. You have a revolt in your own family. Your young children do not want to follow you. They say, we love you, we respect you. But 
actually, what did you do to us? You left us a wall full of wounds, of walls, of discrimination. We have the right to build our own future. We don't accept your assumptions, even not about democracy. If our flag of democracy was free expression, their flag of democracy is self-expression. He says, if I'm young, they'll give me a microphone, I shall go and make speeches. If I'm young and I have an inclination to become a musician or an architect or doctor, whatever you want, I want to go my way. I want to be connected with all people. Now the individual person today, the individual young man, does not need the government. He has a hyphen in his pocket, so he has the government in his pocket. He has all the information, he wants it up to day, right away. And they can connect everybody. And they don't want that their parents will be in the business. They want to speak differently, think differently, dress differently, occasionally with, uh, for good reasons. For example, when I look at the T-shirts and the jeans as a dress, this is a declaration for democracy. Young people don't want that you will know if I'm rich or poor. They want equality. And now the two parts of the youth are in trouble. The ones who are coming from wealthy families and the others who are coming from poor surroundings. The youngsters who are coming from poverty, clearly, would like to have food, respect, future. It wasn't bad to be a poor man when there wasn't great communication. Because when you were in a poor country and you didn't have an internet or a Facebook, you thought the whole world is poor. So we are part of the poverty. But now when you have those eyes and those ears, the modern, and you look around, the young people begin to ask, why is there freedom and affluence? And here it is not. Now the problem of a wealthy young men and the poor young men is different. Because in a wealthy family, the number of children is small, restricted. But the investment in every child must be greater. In order for him to compete with modern age, you have to invest in him more in education, more in freedom. And he is becoming a mature person at a very early age. Today, a girl or a boy of the age of 14, they are better built physically. They are more informed intellectually. They don't like the stories about the past. They think you are trying to teach us irrelevant lessons. What is it important to know exactly in how many battles did Napoleon participate? We know he killed enough people, so we shall remember him. If you want details, press on the internet, they'll tell you exactly where they took place. Stop with it. We are more interested to compare and see the future. On the other hand, the poor youngsters who are coming from large families, they don't know how to escape poverty. They know that they cannot remain as they are. And in many of those countries, where the poor youngsters are coming from, women are discriminated. If the women are discriminated, the children are discriminated. If the woman doesn't have a chance to be educated properly so she can educate her children, if the woman doesn't have a chance to become a constructive partner of the nation, the whole family is discriminated. And actually, it's a hopeless situation. You know, President Obama asked me, who is against, really, democracy in the Middle East? I told them, the husbands. No husband wants to give equal rights to his wife, and all the husbands don't want to give equal rights to the women. If they won't do it, they can't escape poverty. Now the young generation lost respect as the governments are hesitant to govern. 
the young generation doesn't give credit to the governments. They are very suspicious. They say, you have your own personal agenda. Go ahead, we are not interested in you. They want straight service, whether we are poor to escape poverty, whether we are better off to have a better future. And that leads us to the revolution. Actually, the revolution is in every home. You know, when I meet with my children and grandchildren, to be frank, I learned that better for me to listen to them than them listening to me. They're better informed, they're up to date. They are not committed by prejudices and memory. There was a saying in English saying, seeing is believing. The fact is, believing is seeing. We, when you look with your eyes, you look with your prejudices. And every person sees the same thing with a different eye. And people are impressed by general impressions. They don't go into details. And it's very hard to create confidence in the future. For me, I mean, it's clear that we have to be fair and let the young generation having their own future. We shouldn't press upon them to follow us. Let us admit that we were not so great and complete and moral as we claim. And they connect with everybody, black and white, rich and poor, different nations, and they won't stop it. They won't ask your permission for, to do so. But they're also living in a world which lost its balance. The globe lost its balance. It's overpopulated and it's hardly moving around today. There is a shortage of air, of water, of energy, of opportunities. And we are going because in the poor countries, there are poor families with many children. You know, I'm looking around, for example, the country like Egypt. Egypt has grown five times in the last 50 years. Nothing grew in Egypt for five times. Neither the Nile, nor the industry, nor the tourism. Furthermore, along with the Nile River, there are nine countries, and each of them with a grown population. The Blue Nile began, begins at Ethiopia. Ethiopia is also a country of 80 million people. Egypt is 84 million people. And they're also hungry and poor, and they don't have food. So they say, you want to take my Blue Nile? Why? Because the British ones promised you? You have the White Nile in Sudan. Sudan has also grown, it's another 60 million people. And I don't think that we can save those countries from poverty. Because it's an illusion to think that if you pump in money, the situation will really become normal and promising. You know, foreign aid has a problem. Foreign aid actually <coughs> is taking money from poor people in rich countries and handing it over to rich people in poor countries and you create a little bit of corruption. So money is not a solution. And once you use the money, you cannot reuse it. Finish. You cannot recycle money. The only way we have to think how to go out of poverty, and even if those countries will buy computers and Facebooks, it's not enough. Computers and Facebooks will not make them rich. It is a social change like for example, giving women equal right. Like for example, stopping to lie. A dictator cannot exist if he cannot lie. And when you have those communication, it's very hard for the dictators to resist. So you see the dictators now fighting for their life, either with arms or by surrendering. They know it's the end in a way of dictatorship. 
So we have to ask ourselves what to do. And my answer is, the only reservoir we really have is in science. To run our world more scientifically and to add new science to the existing one. More scientifically, for example, when you take water, you can pour water, you can produce, you can save, you can recycle, you can find trees that drink less. I'm coming from a country that actually doesn't have land. There is a small piece of land. Israel is a fifth in size of Ukraine. Ukraine is 15 times larger than Israel. The piece of land we have is desert, refusing land, very difficult land. We don't have water either. We have a famous river, the Jordan River, but this river produces fame, not water. You cannot irrigate with it. It's not a river, really. We have two lakes, one dead, the other is dying. <laughs> so we have no land and no water. What could we do? We went to science. Usually agriculture is an agreement between the Lord and heaven and the poor farmer. It's a very poor partnership because the farmer cannot hang on the Lord in heaven. Here he brings you a drought and here he brings you troubles. So we have a third partner, which is science. And our agriculture is high tech. We produce 10 times more than the average acre in the world. We use a third of the water. And you know, when you compare it to Russia, for example, Russia is 1,000 times the size of Israel in land. Russia has 25% of the sweet water in the world, 1,000 lakes of sweet water. And believe it or not, Israel is exporting carrots to Russia and avocado to Paris and flowers to London. Why I'm saying it, we are not supermen. We are like any other human being, but we really handle it scientifically. And by handling scientifically, you can save water, you can save uh, energy, because we're also short of energy. And now we are facing another challenge. And here I want to say a word about the future. I believe that in the coming 10 years, there will be a, tot a total revolution in science and industry. I feel that we are nearing the electronic age because of the cybernetics. We depend so much upon electronics that one can paralyze another country overnight with the hackers. We don't know how to defend ourselves. In a way, cybernetics are more dangerous than nuclear bombs because to use a nuclear bomb is a sensation. But to paralyze a country or a company without knowing who did it, without leaving fingerprints, is a different story. And you see all over the places, countries and armies are trying to provide an answer what to do. And uh, who will replace electronics? In my judgment, there is just one answer. The human brain. In my judgment, the greatest reservoir for the future is what is contained in this small box. Until now, we used our brain to discover other brains, to produce artificial brains. The brain of Google is better than our brain. We did it practically on all fields but one. We didn't investigate ourselves. We didn't use our brain to discover how does our brain function. It has whatever you want. It has electronics and this is chemistry and the computers, everything in this small, in this small box. You have 100,000 miles of connections, a billion and a half point of nerves. And you know, we wake up in the morning, we don't know really what makes us happy, what makes us angry, what makes us extreme, 
what makes us moderate. We know it's within us, in our own body, in our head, but we don't have the slightest idea. How does it function? The reason is because the head is built of such delicate parts and technologies that all the instrumentation we have had are vulgar to enter the brain. And we can destroy the brain immediately. It's only now, with the nanometer, that we started to enter the brain. Now, a nanometer is the most tiny little instruments in the world. If you take out one hair from your head and you'll split it in 60,000 parts, this is the size of a nanometer. With the nanometer, we started to enter the brain. It's already sensational. It's clear that we can have an interface between the computer and the brain. Namely, we can take parts of the computer and put in our brains, and vice versa. Parts or technologies or strategies of our brain to put in the computer. It uh, has an impact already. For example, we can put an electrode in our brain and overcome illness like Alzheimer and others. We can enter the brain without opening the body and handle directly tumors and others. And I think it began and it will grow very fast for three reasons. Reason number one, because the increase in artificial intelligence went up tremendously. The first computer was introduced 25 years ago. Its strength today is a million times more. From the first computer they would hardly put in this room, you have today iPhone, and the difference is a million times in effectiveness and cost. And it's spreading all the time, and the computer is now going into two directions. It is playing concerts, namely you can have several computers acting together, and it's playing solo. It can answer individual inclinations. The computer will learn who you are and give you an answer to your question that will fit your mentality. The second reason is the number of scientists in the world with the Indians and the Chinese. The society of the community of scientists will go in millions. India is producing 400,000 engineers a year. So is China. And their quantity will become quality. But the third answer, we began and we see it's a great reservoir of alternatives. It can, everybody can be a better person. I just read a book that said actually a child is being born completely altruistic without an ego. The ego begins to develop when he has to fight for his existence. It begins with the parents, the first fight a baby has. The parents like the baby, but they tell him how to sit and how to go, and the baby feels he loses freedom. So he begins to fight for himself, and it goes on, it goes up. And if you shall know what's happening to us, maybe we shall govern ourselves better. You know, when I think, when did civilization start? When we have had the first mirror. Before we had a mirror, we didn't shave, we didn't camp our hair, we didn't wash. We got a mirror, what can we do every morning? We have to be clean, we have to camp our hair. If we shall be able to build a mirror that will show not only our outside look, but our inside decision making, I'm sure that many people will choose to be a better person. So I think we're at a revolutionary age. We're in a crisis because we lost the past and we didn't gain yet the future. If I can recommend to anybody, leave the past alone. Past is dead. Let him lie there quietly without our interference and references. The future is fresh and demanding. Let our children learn how to dream, how to envisage, 
how to have a vision. You know, most people prefer to remember rather than to think. When you say remember, you don't remember really. You remember the good things and you forget the bad things. So it's a discrimination. When you think you don't know everything, but you are challenged, you can see a message, you can see a call, and make the life of each of us and all of us better, meaningful, and satisfy at least the spirit of Shakespeare and the results of Chekhov. Thank you very much.